Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, to gather as your church once again. Lord, it's a blessing and a privilege, and I pray that we never take it for granted. Lord, we, we want to meet with you here now. Holy Spirit, we, we want your presence. We want you to stir through the word. Stir in our hearts. Help us to focus on Jesus. Father, thank you for sending him down from heaven on his rescue mission to live a sinless life, to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again so that if we profess faith, we believe, we cling to him, we can be saved. Lord, we want to lift up uh, just praises to you for what you've done. We're, we're, we're doing this ESL ministry, Lord, in March because we feel led by your spirit to do so as a way to love our community and to serve our community. And we're so thankful that we already have people interested. God, we just pray that you would continue to lead us and guide us and direct us as we seek to serve and to love and to share. Lord, I thank you for uh, your generosity expressed through your people in our missions offering. God, that's a blessing. It's such a blessing to be able to send on monies to missionaries around the world, to send on monies to help other churches be planted across the United States of America. And Lord, to help the missionaries that we're supporting. And, and Lord, we just want to lift up uh, Chris and Susan Toller today in central Mexico. They've, they've left the United States, they've left Texas, they left their home, and they've been down there for years serving the Pame people trying to put the, the Bible in the heart language of this people that, that otherwise would not have it. And so we pray your blessing on them. We ask that you would encourage them this day. You would keep the enemy far from them, that you would restore their health where it has failed them and that you would protect their health where it hasn't. Lord, encourage them in every possible way. Lord, and I pray if it's your will that we would be able to go and see them and join them and serve them in some capacity. Lord, we now ask that you take this time, that you open your word to us, that your spirit imprints it upon our hearts, and that we leave this place not, div not just having heard it, but obeying it and living it out. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4, verses uh, 14, excuse me, 10 through 14, verses 10 through 14 of Philippians chapter 4. And so... One of my favorite phrases from the military was misery loves company. I served in the United States Army, and I'm telling you, that's true. However, I think you could also possibly say that that statement was invented by a parent. Because if you have parented, misery also loves company either way. Like your kids could say that or you could say that. However, I think as a culture, what that helps us to understand is that we're weird. Right, that we would even come up with something that, that sounds like that. Misery loves company. Let me show you how weird we are as Americans. So I'm in the Army, right? I was in the military, and we did, like, basic training, and we would do obstacle courses. We would crawl through the mud. You'd crawl under barbed wire. Do all these crazy things with people screaming at you the whole time. Now you can pay to do that. Right now, there's actually this whole movement. It's called like Spartan races or obstacle court races. And you see pictures on Instagram of, of people who are paying money to go out into the woods, to go on courses set up all around cities and, and across our country, and they will crawl through the mud. They'll crawl through obstacles. They'll, they'll jump over walls, and they'll have people screaming at them. And even some of them, they have these foam bats, and they hit you. And they're smiling. Okay, I wasn't smiling at Fort Knox, Kentucky, okay? I was like miserable. But we pay to do these things. Yet, what you see are people smiling. And what you'll also see in these pictures of people smiling is that they're with a group. And it's usually a group of coworkers, or it might be some family friends or something like that, or some hunting buddies who've decided for some insane reason to pay money to do this. Misery loves company. What's going on in that moment? Well, there's shared suffering. There's fellowship. There's common purpose. There's unity. And through all of that then shines joy, even though what they're doing is fundamentally not fun. If we just said today, walk out of the door and climb into the mud, that's not fun. But yet here it is. You see, it seems like somebody somewhere got some insight from Scripture and thought, I'm going to market what the Apostle Paul is telling the church at Philippi. 
Misery loves company. Now, what has Paul taught the Philippians so far? We're, we're almost to the end of the letter. We've got one sermon left. So let's just recap the big idea. Indomitable joy comes from gaining Christ. Indomitable joy is the theme, and gaining Christ is the how-to. Like, how do you get indomitable joy? By gaining Christ. It's the main idea. It's the main exhortation, right? Gain Christ. How do you do it? Whatever it takes. That's what Paul tells the church. Do whatever it takes to gain Christ. And then throughout the letter, he's summarized two main points on how we do that. There's two like applications, two how-tos. The first one is this. We have to have the right mindset. And the right mindset is the humility of Jesus Christ. Paul talks about in the middle of chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, you have the humility of Jesus Christ. That's what the church, that's what we reflect. That's to be one of the character traits we develop, the humility of Christ. The second one is this. We need the right approach, the right approach to God in prayer. And what is that approach? Thanksgiving. We approach God through prayer with thanksgiving. Whatever our specific situation or our circumstances, we gain Christ if we do those two things. But yet there's still something missing. There's one more layer that Paul wants to add. There's something that we need to learn and that the Philippians need to learn that he had learned. So I want you to anchor to this big idea as we walk through this text today. It's this, consistently pursuing humility, consistently pursuing humility and a heart of thanksgiving teaches us to be content in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. Consistently pursuing humility and a heart of thanksgiving teaches us to be content in Jesus Christ. Look at verse, uh, verses 10 through 12 of chapter 4 with me. What we're going to see here in verses 10 through 12 is that proper concern produces joy. Okay, proper concern produces joy. And circumstances teach us how to be content. Verse 10 says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance in need. And let's stop right there. Now, what's going on here? This is a direct connection. This is just the outflow of verses one through nine. Paul has, has given a series of several commands just stacked on top of one another like airplanes on a runway. Bam, 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 bam. And now what he does in verses 10 through 12 is he starts applying them in his own life. He says, look at me. Here's, here's my example. I wanted you to look at it. And here it is. And so he says, he starts off with, I rejoiced in the Lord. Where have we heard that before? Verse four, look back at verse four. Re rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And here we see Paul rejoicing. I rejoiced in the Lord. Then what do we see? We see he's, he says, you have revived your proper concern for me. Where have we heard that word before, concern? It's actually been in the letter several times. But most immediately, we go back up and he, he's talking about anxiety in verse six. Do not be anxious about anything. You see, that's improper concern. That's concern that's out of control. That's being overly concerned. So here, Paul's talking about how the Philippians have revived proper concern, where before, or currently, they're facing overly concern, anxiety. If we look at the rest of verses 10 through 23, what we see just drips of thanksgiving to God. Paul is just pouring it all out. He's saying, this is why I'm thankful. This is why you should be thankful. Hey, I'm thankful for you, Philippians. I am thankful for the gospel mission, and I'm thankful for the results of what God has done in our midst. Over and over and over again. Jump to the end of the letter. Verse 22, just briefly look at verse 22 if you have your Bible with me. Let me read this to you. Paul's closing it out. This is the very end. All the saints greet you especially those of Caesar's household. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar household, Caesar's household. Where have we heard that before? Turn back just one page in your Bible. Look at chapter one, verses 12 and 13. 
What's Paul saying here? I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He starts and ends the letter with the result. He starts and ends the letter with the result of what God has done in their midst. Now, when we have humility and we have thanksgiving pushing us to contentment, right? When we have humility and we have thanksgiving pouring out of our hearts and it's pushing us to contentment, we start to focus on what God wants. That becomes the focus. That becomes our joy. And when God delivers, we rejoice even more. And that's what's happening to Paul here. That's what he's showing and teaching the Philippians. Now, Paul speaks of joy and a joyful mindset at least a half, t- half a dozen times in the letter. He keeps coming back to this mindset, this intentional way of thinking. And this is how he starts the letter. Let me just remind you. You can go back to chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 with me, and we'll see it here. I thank my God, very beginning, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. So as he's thinking of the Philippians, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Joy, joy, joy. It's just this drumbeat throughout the letter. He keeps coming back to it. So if we want to think about the big concepts in the letter, joy and thanksgiving are best friends and roommates. They always occupy the same space. You never find joy without thanksgiving and you never find thanksgiving without joy. They are together always in the Christian walk and the Christian faith. And I'm speaking in Christian terms, not the world's version of it. We always find joy and thanksgiving together. So if you're sitting here today and you go, well, struggling with joy, check your thanksgiving. Are you starting with prayer? Thanking God for all the blessings that you have in your life? Well, well, I'm, I'm struggling to, to be thankful. Well, do you have joy? Are you content in the Lord? So this is what's going on. This is what Paul is trying to demonstrate for the Philippians. He wants them to see the connection between these two ideas. Now, in the letter, Paul has shown proper concern repeatedly. He's shown proper concern in prayer. He's shown proper concern in how he has act and behaved. He's shown proper concern in a response to the Philippians. He's taken steps to correct where they've gone astray. So he's demonstrating proper concern repeatedly. And he gives them an example, Timothy, right? He says, I'm gonna send Timothy to you guys. And Timothy's gonna do what? He's gonna demonstrate genuine concern. Ah, so we have proper concern, we have genuine concern. What's Timothy's genuine concern? Well, he wants to serve the church. He's willing to go and instruct and encourage. And then we see here in verse 10 that at one point, the Philippians also had proper concern. He says, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So at one point, the Philippians were in the zone. They were anchored to humility in thanksgiving, and it was producing proper concern towards Paul. So what he's trying to do is to bring that back up in their minds. You had it at one point, but it got out of control. You see, you supported me materially. You supported me spiritually. You supported me emotionally. Notice how each one of these individuals, Paul, Timothy, and the Philippians, when we're talking about genuine concern or proper concern, it's an action. It's an action oriented towards someone else. That's what genuine concern looks like. When I'm showing love for someone else, when I'm taking an action on their part because of a situation that I see, well, anxiety, out of control, self-concern is the opposite. It's self-focused. It's inward. When my concern's gotten off the rails, all I'm concerned about is me. How does it impact me? What's going on in my world, in my bubble? Anxiety is the exact opposite of genuine concern. Now, it looks the same for us today. What the Philippians are going through, we go through. We get concerned about something, and instead of taking action, if we don't have thanksgiving and humility, then it becomes all about us. Do you see the trap? It's the same emotion, concern, concern, same emotion, but there's two spectrums. 
You have anxiety on one end and genuine concern on the other. And Paul is saying, look, Philippian church, you need to go from here over to genuine concern. Hey, by the way, it's in the Bible. Cross community, you need to go from anxiety to genuine concern, from self-focused to other-focused. The present reality for both Paul and the Philippians is this. This is, this is it. Let me summarize it for you. Paul is physically in prison, but he's spiritually free. Paul is physically in prison, but he is spiritually free. The Philippians are physically free, but spiritually in prison. Do you see the difference? Why? Anxiety. Being overly concerned. Paul is now going to turn around and give the Philippians the key to the jail. Here's how you get out. It's verse 11. He says, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Contentness, contentedness is the key to the anxiety jail. Now, just generally speaking, to be content is, is a state of being. Any, any human on earth, if you're going to ask them when they're content, it's when they're having a cup of coffee, when they're relaxed, when things are going well. That's not what Paul's talking about. It's not. Same idea emotionally, but different in how it looks in application. So let's just recap what the Philippians are overly concerned about. What are they having anxiety about? It's this. Uh, first off, persecution. They're under attack for their faith. It's hard to be a Christian. Someone should have told them. They wouldn't have done it, right? That's the state they're at. They're undergoing anxiety from persecution. They also have anxiety over the health of a loved one. Remember Epaphroditus, their friend. He almost died. They thought he did die. And so they're concerned about him. They're concerned about the imprisonment of their friend and leader, Paul. They have internal disunity. Remember the argument we looked at a couple of weeks ago between Eudea and Syntyche. Two leaders in the church having a fight. It's bringing about anxiety. They're concerned about the future and the promises of God. Note how Paul repeatedly talks about the resurrection, the future faith, what they will become. He's pointing them forward to when they're with Christ. So there's a concern in the church about the future and the promises of God. What else? They're just concerned about suffering in general. Like Paul goes over that repeatedly in the letter. So all of these things together are causing severe anxiety in the church. And keep in mind, this is a group exercise. This isn't about you as an individual having anxiety. This is about a church in total having anxiety. So it is something they're talking about. It's spreading amongst the membership like wildfire. Each adverse circumstance that Paul has brought up in the letter has acted as a multiplier, an X multiplier of worry for the Philippians. Each time something happens, it's just an exponential effect. It just gets bigger and bigger until, until they have this monster of anxiety lurking in the congregation. But for Paul, here's what he says. You're looking at it completely wrong. Each situation should be, learn, should be viewed as a learning opportunity for you. How? Well, they need to apply what they've already heard. If you apply the mind of Christ, which is humility, and you lead out in thanksgiving, then things change. Your circumstances, they may be the same, but they're viewed differently. Let's, here's the example. Here's the illustration. This is what Paul is showing them. Paul's in prison. He's in prison. Yet, he starts and finishes the letter in joy. Why? Because the gospel is moving forward. What's Paul's focus? The mission the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I'm here. That's what I'm doing. And look what's going on, praise God. I'm in prison. It's fantastic. That's his response. Paul has the key to the spiritual prison. You can't keep him in it. He just keeps unlocking the door and walking out. It doesn't matter where you put him. He's spiritually free. Now, Paul views all circumstances then, good or bad, as simply a vehicle to get God's results. That's it. It doesn't matter if it's a good circumstance or a bad circumstance from the human perspective. What Paul is doing is saying, look, it doesn't matter. Whatever the circumstance is, it puts me right where God wants me to do what God wants me to do. Would that change your joy? Would that change your perspective? Now, if you read verse 12, 
several times, something's gonna jump out at you. Let me just read it for us again. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. I know in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Positive and negative circumstances carry the same weight for Paul. It's the point he's making. doesn't matter. They're both teachable for us. We might think that we learn contentment only in positive circumstances because how can you possibly learn contentment in a negative circumstance? Here, here's the issue with that. If I'm saying that I'm only content when there's a positive circumstance, how do I know? Right? How do I know I'm actually content until the positive circumstances are taken away and now I face suffering? Well, what do I miss in suffering? Okay, well, now I have something to contrast it with. If your life is nothing but, but rainbows and unicorns and roses, you never have an actual idea if you're content or not. There has to be something to contrast it with to find out what's real. What do I hold on to in suffering? And for Paul, what he's done is, is going through these positive and negative circumstances. He's seen that I gain Christ. The consistency in either circumstance is Christ and he never changes. Therefore, I can be content. That's the reality for Paul, and that should be the reality for every Christian in the room. That should be the reality for every Christian on the face of the planet, yet it's not. You see, Paul uses the word learned. I have learned in whatever situation. Learning's optional, guys. Learning is optional. I can stand here and preach, but I can't make you learn. Learning has to be willing. It has to be an active process. Paul's objective is to learn humility, he's talked about it, and is to pursue thanksgiving to gain Christ. He's gonna do that over and over and over again. He's gonna learn more about humility and he's gonna learn some more about it. He's gonna pursue thanksgiving and he's gonna pursue it some more. Why? So I can gain Christ. That's what he's doing. If that is your intent, Christian, then you can be just like Paul. No matter what happens to you, no matter what occurs in your life, you'll start to produce contentment. Now, the Philippians, though, are not on this train. They're off the tracks. The Philippians, the Americans, cross-community Christians, ex-Baptist church Christian, ex-community church Christians are not in this space. Why? Because we all equate contentment with our circumstances. We got to have the right circumstances to be content. Right? That's... No, that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that is wrong thinking. That is actually idolatry. That's putting your contentedness tied to something else, a circumstance. That's now your God versus being content in Christ. True contentment, true contentment is independent of your circumstances. We've just identified the problem for most of us, right? If you're sitting there and going, man, it's been a rough week got into a car wreck, lost my job, had a fight with my spouse. And in Houston, you can do all those in the morning, right? I mean, seriously. <laughs> Are you still content in the Lord? Okay, let's go to something more serious. What about the death of a loved one? What about a significant negative health diagnosis or something along those lines? Are you still content then? Most of us would say no. Why? Why? Why is this an issue? Why is this an issue in, in just about every church I've ever, I've ever been in with just about every Christian I've ever met? Why? Well, Paul is explaining it to us in chapter three, verse eight. He's already given us the answer. Look with me at chapter three, verse eight of Philippians. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Let me read that again. Let me make sure you understand it. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Christ is the point. Everything else is trash. If I have nothing left, in, nothing left but Christ, I have everything. If I have everything but not Christ, I have nothing. Is that your attitude? 
Do you lack joy? Read the verse again. That's all I can do, right? If you lack joy, read this verse again. Read it until you start to get joy back because you realize Christ is worth everything. If I'm like Paul, then I believe that the equation equals everything is loss, Christ is gain. That's it. I'm, I'm all in on that equation. But it has to be more than just words. It has to be the core belief in my life. This is step one to the process. Steps two and three we've already talked about. It's humility and thanksgiving. We do this to internalize the idea that Christ is the greatest gain. So you have to believe that. You have to practice that. And then you have to start putting on that humility. Conscious choice number two. Conscious choice number three. I got to start producing thanksgiving in my heart. I have to respond to God for all the blessings he showered upon me. Now, we go back to this idea of, of plenty and loss, of, of abundance and need. You see, Christ, Paul is dealing with plenty the same way. When we think about Thanksgiving and what produces Thanksgiving in us, it's usually like the blessings is what we focus on. Like I have plenty of something. I have plenty of money or whatever that may be. Whatever I value. Paul is sitting there in prison saying that I have plenty. I have all that I need. I'm being showered with blessings and we look at him like he's crazy. But here's why he thinks that way. You see, despite what we think's going on, despite what the Philippians think is going on, Paul is saying, look at all the blessings in my life. And we're just like, what are you talking about? You're in prison. How can you have blessing? We're free and we're terrified. He's like, exactly. Well, look at the blessings in Paul's life. Well, number one, we have this letter. We have the letter to the Philippians. And this letter is in the New Testament and I'm preaching through it. And thousands of Christians, millions of Christians, maybe even billions of Christians through time have read this letter since it was written 2,000 years ago. That's something that Paul is praising God for. All right, that's a blessing. Now, you're going, okay, Dell, but he didn't know that. True. At the moment he penned these words, he did not know this was going to be in the New Testament and that Cross Community Church will be reading it 2,100 years later. He didn't know that. But what he did know was that the Philippian church would read it. He knew his friends would see it. He knew they would be impacted by it. He had the opportunity to share and to communicate what God had done. That's a blessing he's recognizing. What else? He's seen the gospel go forth. Like Paul's praying, if you read the letter to the Romans, like Paul's prayed for the Romans. He, he wants the gospel in Rome. Now where's Paul? He's in Rome. And what's happening? The gospel is everywhere. The church has been encouraged Paul's saying that is a blessing. I have more than I could ever want right now. You see, if you focus on God's mission, that's where the contentment is, right? The Philippians don't recognize that. We don't recognize that. Hey, 15 of our friends and neighbors have decided to come and let us serve them by sharing the gospel by, by serving them and helping them to understand and learn English so they can, they can progress in jobs so they can, they can protect themselves and not be taken advantage of, right? By taking part in our ESL program. Praise God for that. That's amazing, right? It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. God's moving in that ministry already and it hasn't even started yet. Do you wanna be where God's working? Participate in that ministry, right? Henry Blackaby, a famous theologian, uh, he, he would say, how do you, how do you know, like, like, how do you know to serve God, right? You find out where he's working and you join him. And often our approach is we, we try to go do something to have God bless it. Like, God has been inspiring us to do this. He's been leading us to do this. It's a blessing. So, hey, I had a bad week last week, but I was fired up about this. Like, all the problems of last week, I don't care because I'm looking forward to what God is gonna do. So, Paul did not develop this ability to be content instantly. It didn't just happen like that. He witnessed the faithfulness of the Lord throughout his life. It's a long-term project. And so as he's developing more and more contentment, he's applying humility to it, and he's pursuing thanksgiving, and it's stacking on top of each other. And what's happening is, 
It's like an assembly line and contentment is coming out the other side. And the building blocks are thanksgiving and humility. This is the secret that Paul's passing on to you today. You see, if we think about Christ being our greatest gain, then that means we understand that he took care of our biggest problem already, right? That means we understand that Jesus Christ was born as a human child, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins because we're sinners, separated from God, rose again in the flesh so that if we believe in him, if we confess our sin and tell him we need to be saved, then we now have Christ. We've gained Christ. He is now our greatest treasure and our greatest possession and we are his. If we believe that and we do that, then suddenly we can start to put our other problems into perspective. Jesus Christ was designed to bear the weight of humanity's sin. He can take care of your problem. If he can handle the sin for all humanity, for all time, he can heal what's hurting you. Look with me at verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens, who, who strengthens me. I can misapply this verse as many times as humanly possible in my lifetime. That's what it should say. Um, because this ter- verse is usually ripped out of its context, plastered on a sign over your desk or on a football player's band-aids or something like that, and it doesn't mean what it, they think it means. This verse is about applying humility and thanksgiving that activates our learned contentment. You see, Paul passes on his secret to us, which is to apply liberal amounts of Christ's humility and thanksgiving to our lives to produce contentment, right? That's what he's talking about here. When that happens, when, when those two character traits work together in, con, in, in concert, right, they're producing contentment, and then we, have, we need a definition for contentment. I already told you earlier that the state of being, this kind of a, a good state of being, is like the general human definition of contentment. Here's Paul's definition of contentment in the context of the verses. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's his definition of contentment. Let me read verses 12, 13, and 14 together so you kind of understand it in its full context. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. I would urge you to never read verse 13 without reading 12 and 14. Because then we understand Paul's talking about suffering. I can bear anything through him who strengthens me. I can stand in the face of gospel persecution through him who strengthens me. I can stand the embarrassment of being the only Christian who's not participating in that activity that my friends are because of him who strengthens me. You see the difference? It's not about accomplishing thing to, anything to glorify yourself. It's about your life being aligned with God's will to accomplish what he wants and to bear any burden that you need to to do that. Humility and thanksgiving work together to help us to suffer hardship well. So if we think through this, we understand that contentment is a long-term project. It varies in size. Hopefully it's always growing in our life. That's what we're after. This is God's secret weapon that Paul's giving us to be able to accomplish his mission. Now, if we just pause for a moment, we think about how Paul has gone through this so far, and he's, he has this group of friends that are, are not like quite there. What's his, what's his secret weapon to like get them back into the game? Like, what's he doing? So he's, he's laid out the issues. Like, I'm suffering, but I'm happy. You're not suffering, and you're not happy. We gotta fix that. Right, And now I have the secret to that I want to pass on to you. It's contentment. And you get contentment by understanding that you can bear anything the world throws at you if you have Christ as your greatest, greatest gain. So now they're back, right? Maybe. I don't know. We'll see at the end. But let's look at a quick picture 
of a group of people that did it wrong. Okay, because the Bible has lots of good examples, positive and negative. Turn with me back to Exodus in the Old Testament. Second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 17. And let me show you this example of, of a group of people that did this the wrong way. That completely lost focus of everything. Let me set this passage up for you while you're turning there. We're in Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. In the previous three chapters of Exodus, God has done some miraculous things. He's delivered the nation of Israel through the Red Sea. Moses parting the waters, or God parting the waters, and Moses there. He leads the people through the Red Sea. They're rescued from the the Egyptians who are pursuing them. Okay, it's miraculous. It's awesome. It's one of the greatest miracles in the Bible. Everybody knows about that. Well, then the next chapter, what happens? They're in the desert. They need something to drink, and they come up to this water, and it's bitter. Can't drink it. Bitter water. What does God do? He makes it sweet so they can drink it. Next thing, they're still wandering around, and they have no food. They have water. They've been delivered, but they need something to eat, and God provides manna from heaven. He feeds them. And so then we get to Exodus 17. And now this thirsty, hot, hungry people are still complaining to Moses. Look at the text with me. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. So they're marching. And they camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, listen to this, by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Now, just delivered through the Red Sea. By the way, they were guarded by a cloud of fire, okay? They go through the Red Sea. They have this miracle of bitter water made sweet. They have manna from heaven. Is, is the Lord among us or not? Because we're a little thirsty. Things got a little hard. That's where the Philippians are. That's sometimes where we get Things get a little difficult, and we forget all the blessings that God has showered upon us. If you have the breath to complain to God about your situation, you should be praising God because you have the breath to complain about your situation, right? That's where where Paul is trying to get them. They are so far from that. They were not content. Did they have a legitimate need? Yes. And God knows that, and God had consistently provided. Did they have thanksgiving and humility? No. No. Absolutely not. None. The people of Israel were not content because they lacked the necessary ingredients to be content. And anxiety was the result. They lost sight of God. The same thing happens to us. The positives they're willing to observe, but they don't help. There's no gratitude for the manna. There's no gratitude for the bitter water being sweet. There's no gratitude for the deliverance from Pharaoh's army. Spiritually, they are in prison, even though God had freed them physically. They're exactly where the Philippians are, and they're exactly where most of us spend our time if we don't do this. We can put ourselves in prison if we look at the wrong source of contentment. Here's some bad sources of contentment. Don't have any contentment in your health, okay? I was just sharing with one of the guys earlier about the fact that, I mean, there are more things broke on me than fixed, okay? I'm of the age now where I just count what doesn't hurt. It's easier, your health, your health will fail you. Finances. You may have a great job now, but what about tomorrow? Right? Or you may have no job today, and you may have a great one tomorrow. Don't tie your contentment to that. What about status and social friends? Do I have the right friends, the right people? Do I, do I know how to get into the right places? Don't worry about that. It could change tomorrow. In general, just for guys, I know it's our work 
in our job, right? We're, we're very much status-driven, and we have a lot of contentment in what we do. That's why we introduce ourselves that way. Hey, I'm a teacher. I'm an engineer. I'm a doctor, right? Are any of these things permanent? No. Do all of them sound familiar as sources of contentment to us? Yes. Now, we fast forward from Exodus back to this prison in Rome. Paul is tired. He is hungry. He is in prison. He's under the threat of death, and he's concerned about the well-being of his friends, and he's content. He's content. He's satisfied in the Lord, even though all these other things are going on. It sounds absolutely insane. This never happens to anyone except it's happening in you. God's doing this in you. As you pursue humility, as you pursue thanksgiving, God is doing this in you today. Trust, have faith, keep pursuing, keep running. That's what Paul encouraged us in chapter three, right? Keep running the race. So Paul has everything he needs and we have everything we need, right? Not so fast. Let's look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. I'm just gonna stop there. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. You see, in community, in community, your content, your contentment becomes, even comes in the midst of trial. So in community, in the covenant community, in the church, your contentment comes even in the middle of trial. Nothing that Paul is developing here is being developed on his own. It's being developed by the word, by the Holy Spirit, with the church. Paul has an army of friends who are praying with him. He has churches supporting him. You cannot develop contentment apart from Christ. You also can't develop it apart from the church. That is not the way he designed it. The Lord blessed Paul with friends. He's already thanked many of them throughout the letter. Timothy, Epaphroditus, Clement, Eudea, Syntyche. We actually have the names of the people that Paul hung out with. These were the people that he wept with and had sorrow with and had joy with and talked about the birth of babies and, and went and had lunch and ate with and, and went and did mission with. He went to funerals, weddings, all of it. His contentment was developed in community. Suffering stinks. It is no fun. But if you've got a group of people, remember those Spartan racers, those obstacle racers? Suddenly, what is hard by ourselves is fun together. We can have joy together. If the world can figure that out, the church should be able to because we have the true source. It's how we should live. You have a church full of people ready to come alongside you no matter what you're going through. We're here to help you with contentment. You're here to help us with contentment. You may have to suffer Monday through Saturday out in the world, physically alone, but you can't get away from our prayers. And you can't outrun God. We're with you. He's with you. Have confidence. We are to make disciples of all peoples. That's the command of our Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 28. The Lord intends for the church to be the pressure cooker of contentment. Like that's the dish being produced. And the recipe is simple. You gain Christ right? You have a healthy helping of gaining Christ, and then you put in a bunch of his followers, and then you add a, a heaping amount of humility, and then you put in bunches of thankful hearts. And it goes under pressure, and what pops out is this superb dish called contentment. It's how it works, folks. As you suffer for the faith, the burden is shared as you suffer for the gospel. When you're doing something hard as a team, isn't, um, isn't it amazing how that bond just continues to develop? I've gone around the world with people, with Christians, to preach the gospel, to train pastors, to do all of those types of things. And what's funny is all of those men I went with, those, those men and women I went with, I'm still close with. Because we suffered together for a purpose. And even though it stunk at the time, we have joy when we think back on it now. Contentment, being content in Christ, in the Christian manner, is not transitory. It's an intentional state, uh, state of being that we all need to stay in. But you cannot do it alone. You need the church. Have you heard this before? Yes, because Paul consistently points back to the need of the church. The blessings of God come forth in the church. 
They are not meant to be, they're not meant to be applied individually. You need the church to apply the blessings of God to include contentment. Contentment is both learned and expressed through a thousand little acts of faith. To be content in Christ is consistently earned and it's never just given. It's never just endowed. You have to fight for it. But in the process of gaining Christ, you learn contentment. And once you learn that you've gained him, do you need anything else? But like I said, it is a fight. It's a mental fight. It's an emotional fight. It's a spiritual fight. But in Christ, you prevail. In the church and with the church, you prevail. Through the power, through the power of the Holy Spirit in you, you prevail. Folks, you cannot lose your salvation. Impossible. Once you're saved, you're always saved. But you can lose your contentment. Just separate from the church. I guarantee you it will go away. Consistently pursuing humility and a heart of thanksgiving teaches us to be content in Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Let me talk you through two ways to respond to this text today. As you're sitting there in your seats with your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit. You just heard the word preached and he wants you to do something with that. And from this text, we need to examine what we consider as our source of contentment. Is it gaining Christ or is it a false source? You see, a fake source of contentment will hold up for a little while, but ultimately it will fail. The world and the culture are constantly bombarding you with false sources of contentment. Don't take the bait. Our collective objective is to gain Christ and to count everything else as loss. If your contentment is in anything other than Christ alone today, you need to take care of that because what you have embraced is an idol, an idol that will never satisfy you. It is an idol that will fail you at critical moments. Lay down your anxiety today. Lay down your idol and gain Christ. Now, contentment without Christ is impossible. If Christ is not in your heart, you can fake it for a little while, but you end up in cycles of hurts and disappointments. This is no way to live. It's not how God wants you to live. God wants so much more for you, but it starts with Christ. If you want to see the joy that you see in Paul, you have to put your faith in Christ alone. He will not disappoint and you do this by believing that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, came down from heaven, was born as a human baby, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for you and for me, taking our punishment and our shame for sin. But he rose on the third day so that if we repent of our sins and we believe in him, then we can be saved. If you've never done that today, I would invite you to do that now. You can come up and talk to me about it. This is our corporate prayer time. If you have any prayer need, I would love to pray with you. If you want to talk about salvation, I'm here. If you want to talk about baptism, I'm here. If you have any other need, you can use this time. If you need someone to pray with, we'll have people up front to pray with you. I'm going to pray and you respond to however the Lord leads. Father, thank you so much for this time today. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the recipe you gave us for contentment. Thank you for the key that we needed to get out of our spiritual prison. But God, it doesn't mean anything if we don't use it. So please convict our hearts where we've failed, where we've grown lax, where we've stopped pursuing humility, where we've stopped being thankful to you for everything you've done for us and everything you're doing for us right now. Lord, help us to just fall in love with you again. Jesus, help us to know that our greatest gain is you and you alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Please stand.